Hello everyone, uh, my name is Robert Annis. Uh, I'm an Agile coach and trainer, but what does that mean? It's a pretty common title these days. Um, my focus is very much on organizational agility, um, but not merely based upon the normal approach of Agile and Scrum and those kinds of things. We really focus on organizational and individual psychology. So really my focus is very much on the growth and development of people and their organizations through well understood uh, psychological theories and practices. Um, and that's really led me down a, a certain path that isn't just your standard approach. Um, so a lot of the things that I focus on aren't just about agility. They're about the things that align with it and frankly, sometimes become necessary for Agile to succeed. So really my, my background focuses on that and that's really where my career path is, is leading me more and more. Um, so I'm hoping with the discussion with John to bring a bit of that to, that to it's of interest, really. Fingers crossed. Robert, awesome. I, I often get asked, uh, what is organizational agility? What does it even mean? Mm. And uh, I was challenged, actually, uh, I think it was three years ago. Uh, I, I wasn't working in a software domain. I was working in non-software. I have been for the last three years, even though I was originally a software developer. But I was asked, you know, what is it, you know? Mm. And uh, because we had uh, people using the word agile all over the place, but what is agility? And is it the same thing necessarily? So um, I think, you know, maybe, maybe let's start with why we need to back up and redefine organizational agility and then introduce uh, what we think it kind of boils down to. Um, and so uh, basically, you know, I'm going to talk about maybe what it's not. Uh, for example, we often hear this expression change theater, you know, where we're just relabeling, you know, moving the seats around the uh, chairs around the Titanic. so to speak words and whiteboards you know uh stickers and all that kind of stuff and dogma step-by-step -step processes and so on and you know and really it's about delivering value in five dimensions which i'm going to get into uh, uh fairly soon and and change is constant it's not something that you manage it's uh mm -hmm. for me I, i'm uh, i work with a lot of clients who have transformations including the current one and and for me it's kind of sad when there are transformations because it should just be the way we do things mm -hmm. in some organizations okay uh, the level of consciousness might not be there yet so we we need these kind of injections to get something moving but we should really be trying to uh uh, set some kind of cadence or some some kind of way where the organization can can improve itself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe uh, I'd like to talk about as well, what does it look like? What does it feel like uh, when we really have uh, have that? I mean, what, what, what have you noticed so far, Robert? Wow. <laughs> this is a big topic. Yeah. Um, so I mean, organizational agility, it, it's... It's anything and everything. I think one of the biggest issues with agility is it's a word in the dictionary and therefore can mean anything. If they'd made up a word and then defined it, it would be very, very clear, right? Um, but yeah, agile can mean anything. I mean, I, I, I get a little tired of people sort of saying to me, oh, we'll just, we don't know what we're doing. We'll, just, we'll figure it out later. We'll be agile. That's, that's not what it means. <laughs> um, so I think organizational agility for me is, is um, it won't be the same for everyone, so please don't think that I, I have yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but for me personally, it means a few different things. One, it means a new organizational um, um, model in the sense of organizational theory. So at the beginning of time, when humans started off, there was no organization, so we were individuals. And then as time moved on, we started living together in small groups. And finally, those became tribes. You had chiefs. And at that point, you start having people understanding how that organization works. You keep marching forwards and you get to the Industrial Revolution. And now you're at the point of quite a, a complicated way of working. People understand long term plans, things like that. But now the world we live in is quite different. Um, it's much more complex technologically, it's much more complex from a globalization point of view. And so it's not about agility being a target, it's not about becoming agile. For me, organizational agility is about being agile in our thinking, being open to change, not achieving a target as such. Yeah, I agree. Um, so it's not yeah. about an end state. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think that for me is a big shift because most other things are um, read a book and know how to do it. You know what yeah, I mean? Totally. Um, and I think it's, 
I think, as you said in, in the previous um, video, it's, it's about being adaptive. And maybe that's a big part of the fact that you're building the organization to work and think that way. Um, and then the other piece, John, for me is about where the responsibility lies, that it's no longer held with the higher ups, that it's something that's spread across the organization, because that's what allows the organization to be agile. The decisions are not only made at the top. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And um, um, for that reason, when we're talking about, you know, what the end might be, I think it's 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 useful to understand what value means because uh, we've been talking about value so much and what does it mean. Mm. So I, I made an attempt, Robert, to come up with something and I'd love to... Ooh, um, this should be interesting. Yeah, it's, I, I've been thinking about this over a few years and the, this is my fourth attempt now, believe it or not. Um, so, you know, God love me. But... Uh, so I think value can be a mixture from a few different perspectives. And I wouldn't be preaching to anybody about what they should be, but you, you could kind of pick and choose depending what organization you are, I guess. And uh, so the most obvious one would be uh, value from the market, uh, for the market, the customer, the uh, consumer, the end user selling, meeting uh meeting needs and wants, I guess, and uh, changing, mm -hmm. changing behavior uh, in, in a good way. Uh, there's the boring old one, uh, which we have to accept, which is organizational value. Sometimes organizations do want to be more efficient and so on. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. I think uh, uh, try to do the right thing and then try to do it right or later. Uh, but if you're trying to just do the, the wrong thing right, or as Russell Akov said, you're just going to be wrong or right. So uh, but it is something to be considered, uh, to be fair. And there's also stakeholders that we need to worry about and employees, of course, you know, probably one of the more important stakeholders. Um, yeah. And of course, reputation of the organization. There'd be kind of two considerations so far, right? Uh -huh. uh, and then uh, I used to talk about societal value, but I've kind of crystallized that now into the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So I think one of the reasons why the world is in the state that it's in is because we have been chasing customer, end user, consumer value mm -hmm. almost to a fault, That's you right. know, uh, loads of plastic and carbon yeah. and all that kind of stuff. You yeah. know, the 17 goals there, um, not saying which ones you choose, but if you are delivering value, can you reduce your impact on the planet? You know, this kind of mm -hmm. stuff, but there could be other things as well, diversity, inclusion, all that kind of thing as well. Sure. Yeah. And then there's learning. As some people say, learning is the first citizen. And I'm mm -hmm. kind of in that camp a little bit as well. But that could be in relation to the above. Like uh, 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 the customer often struggles to articulate what she wants. So maybe helping her to do that through experiments, uh, looking at analytics, uh, doing research or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think we'd be naive to think that it would be just all of those uh, four points. I think there's an additional, an additional one, which is reducing risk. Okay. Um, John Seddon talks about failure demand, which essentially means doing something that isn't right for the customer, mm -hmm. um, driving some projects home and killing the call centers. So customers are basically ringing with complaints because it doesn't work. And in some cases, 80% of telephone calls going into call centers are customers complaining, quite irate, actually. You don't know how to spell my name. You know, it, it's, right. asked, it's asked me for my password seven times. Yep. This kind of thing. I've only got one hand. I'm on a building side. Why well, you expect me to actually do another code on another phone as well? What are you, what are you talking about? Okay. Um, and also technical mess. Um, I didn't see, say the word technical tech, words technical debt because debt is something that you think you're going to pay back. Sometimes people just create a mess and they don't go back. Um, so reducing that technical mess. And if you have a backlog, uh, like like a product backlog, if you use Scrum, for example. I often talk about sticks of dynamite that are down the product backlog. You know, do we need to kind of bring them up and do a little bit of a controlled explosion mm -hmm. and find out if this is going to if this is going to blow up? Like, a, uh, you know, can we kill this uh, before we spend loads of millions, kind of thing, and uh, lots of energy? Yeah. So, uh, what are your thoughts on that, um, Rob, Rob, Robert? Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of value, um, it's a really interesting discussion. It's, this isn't just an agile discussion. Uh, it's just a concept of value is an interesting topic in itself. I, yeah. For me, I struggle with um, absolutes. Yeah. Um, the sort of what is value? Yeah. Right? Because whenever you try and define it, it's going to be different from somebody else. Yeah. Right? Um, and I think that's one of the risks we have to consider. 
And I think that the second risk with the absolutes of value is that you can just cheat the system. And we see this all the time when one of my clients, they, they had this, this is how we understand value. And it was sort of impact and urgency effectively. Mm. And my argument was simply, well, how do you ascertain the impact and how do you ascertain the urgency? And they said, well, we talk to the people who it's going to impact and we talk to people who it's going to urgency. So, well, can't they just lie? If they want their piece, can't they just say, well, it's really impactful. It's really urgent. Mm. How is that a measurement? So they're basing these absolute figures on things. And it's, it's a bit like um, Scaled Agile Framework, SAFE, has mm. the WSJF weighted shortest job first, right? Yeah. A complicated Hilarious. formula to yeah. understand value. And value doesn't actually mean anything, is my argument. Nothing has any intrinsic value, right? If I said to you, I don't know, money, right? Money's a good example. Money has value. A 50 pound note, a 50 euro note, 50 dollar note, whatever it is, mm. that has value. Only because you, I, and everyone else agrees that it has value. If tomorrow all the banks suddenly said, no, we're not taking 50 pound notes anymore, suddenly that has no value. It only has value because the system it's in, and critically what it's compared, that 50 pound note is valuable because it can buy you this much of something. So for me, value is actually a comparison. This is more valuable than that. That's how I ascertain value because an item on its own has no intrinsic value. So I always come back to the fact that whatever it is, it has to be well understood and compared to other things. And then you understand its value compared to that. So that's how I think of value. Um, I'm not saying it's right, <laughs> um, but I struggle with sort of the, the absolutist definition yeah. of value. And I think it's a very hard thing to do. Um, and I don't think there's any correct answer, but I like your idea of trying to understand it to be able to explain it. It's a tricky thing. Yeah, I can totally relate to what you're saying, Robert. I was in a company uh, about 10 years ago and we could actually calculate exactly how much money we were making in US dollars mm -hmm. from the features because it was a mobile app. Yeah. We were sending offers out to the phone and then people would redeem the offer at the till. Boom, ching, ching. You know, we could tell straight away. But we decided even then not to use money as the terminating value because we wanted more people to download the app. Exactly. Um, and use the app and so on. And so, yeah, I've, never, I've, I've had lots of attempts in my naive days of doing formulas and stuff before I ever knew about WizGIF. Mm -hmm. And they're always wrong anyway. They just help you. Uh, yeah, the, there was one brilliant coach that I worked with in Northampton, and she said to me, John, uh, this product owner came to her one day and said, I, I, I can't sort these. Uh, they, I need everything. So, so the coach said, no problem. I'll sort them alphabetically. <laughs> <laughs> and then she went, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> like yeah. a second. And you're right. It does, it's all relative. And, but you, you just need to understand, like, what are we considering here when we, when we talk about this? And, yeah, you can't be absolute about it. I, I totally no, agree with that. No. Yeah. And it does come back to also the idea that there is a right answer. We yeah. know what is most valuable. Yeah. You yeah. won't know until they're all actually out there and they're being used or, or whatever, right? Exactly. I mean, it's so odd to think of what do you consider valuable, right? Yeah. There's so many people out there who became millionaires and billionaires with something you think that would never be valuable. No one's going to want that. And yet you put it out there and it is right um it's it's an interesting thing to think about right the push when mobile phones first became smartphones right was oh i can see a, a sort of web page this is really cool now most people don't use their phones to get web pages they use apps and at first that wasn't the focus but apple's made its billions because they recognize they're building a platform to sell apps right so it's, it's fascinating what is value and i think the answer is it shifts it changes it does. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Very good insights there, Robert. Yeah. So we're now going to move on to what is organizational agility. And I made an attempt to kind of put it together, but the first sentence I'm going to use isn't from me. It's from a man called Ken Schwaber, who is one of the co-authors of the Scrum Guide. I think it still kind of holds. Uh, the purpose of the next segment is not really about coming up with something very pithy, like the sentence I'm going to tell you, which is nice and short, 
the problem with short sentences that are a pity and all that is that people can, it can be very open to interpretation. Mm -hmm. So the rest of this conversation is going to be about trying to be clear about what it actually is. And again, it's not absolute because for different organizations, different words will mean will be higher up the list than others and so on and so forth. But just kind of a starting point to say, well, okay, if you don't know what it is, let's just stick this up on the wall and move the words around and see what works for us and maybe get rid of some of those words. So the, the short sentence is um, organizational agility is an organization's ability to harness change for competitive advantage, which mm -hmm. uh, captures a lot of things. And I, I think it still holds true. What do you think, Robert? I've read it before. Um, I wouldn't have said I, I remembered. I couldn't have quoted it to you. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think it's good. I don't think it covers it for me because... Or maybe it's just because it's constantly adapting and growing and, and yeah. just yeah. doesn't have a true definition, if you like. That yeah. I think the world we're in now, um, I would say effectively that statement covers a VUCA world in my mind, of thinking about the volatility and the uncertainty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's what it's speaking to. And I think we're, yeah. we're kind of there. We're in a world with global pandemics. We're in a world with globalization mm -hmm. at a rate that's, Staggering. The growth of China is unbelievable. Um, Asia is growing at crazy rates, but South America and Africa are really starting to, to ramp up. Um, and technology is growing faster and faster. Right? Just think of Moore's law, um, the rate at which processes are, are gaining transistors mm -hmm. and so on. Um, the world is actually gaining speed in its complexity. Um, so is it about being adapted to change? Absolutely. I think companies are, you have to be that just to survive right now. Um, the question is, how do you be further competitive, I think, in that situation? And then for me, organizational agility, because of that, is more about the mindset of the company of how are we going to meet that challenge? Mm. I think what you just described in, in that statement um, sort of, to me, defines the problem. It doesn't answer it. Maybe. Yeah, and, and you kind mind. of... Yeah, and you kind of confirmed for me as well that it, it was very open to interpretation because it kind of gave you a double take and also gave me a double take. And I think everybody who reads that sentence and I've seen other versions as well, but you could kind of pick what you want out of it and what does it really mean? I think that I think we're kind of uh, the same page there. So yeah. what I did, I made this effort. And, and by the way, one of my talents is not making things simple. So it's, this is a struggle for me, uh, I have to confess. But uh, I made an effort at, you know, trying to come up with something that's as short as possible, but clear. So when you're trying to be clear, it means you kind of makes it a bit longer. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to strike that balance. It's almost like a change story rather than a definition of agility or anything like that. So here's what I came up with so far. And with the help of lots of people, being honest. Okay. So um, here, here, here it goes. So organizational agility is about creating an adaptable organization with higher possibility to drive disruption in society, the industry, and the marketplace. It's manifested through more effectiveness in optimizing current value, which is kind of like milking the cow that we already have, and unrealized value, which is the cow we haven't found yet, right? With more frequency of impact, more quality, more learning, less drag, uh, more flow, then more efficiency, second last word, and more work sustainability so that we can kind of do this for the long term. Right. So that's what I think it is. I'm going to get into later on, what does it look like? What does it feel like? But what's your reaction so far to this, Robert? I like it. Like you said, it's, 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 it's still quite a lot. It's still verbose, mm. but how, how do you not <laughs> yeah. how you describe it without doing that is, is the tricky thing. Um, I think the question for all these things is, um, that sounds like an outcome. This is what the company, the organization will yeah. be yeah. there. Um, and the challenge for all leaders and thinkers is going to be, okay, great. <laughs> and how did you get there? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I, I, one of my favorite books is by Frederick Leloux. I don't know if you've read it. Yeah. Yeah. I read the organizations. Um, and it's very much about this kind of thinking about that. How do you develop in, in that direction? Um, um, but no, I, I really like that. I'm just, it gets me thinking about, um, as my brain will always go back to sort of the psychologically, how, how does a company develop into that? Yeah. Um, I have some ideas on that actually that I'd love to talk to you about in another show. We've got uh, a journey, if you like that. Uh, and the theme is hit delete. So mm -hmm. to, 
to uh, develop this level of consciousness in the organization where we can achieve what we just talked about, uh, we need to delete some things in the organization um, instead of adding things on. Mm. And I'd love to talk to you about that. It's, it's a bit early days, but uh, probably within a couple of months, I should be able to uh, talk more about that. And, and you probably have some ideas on it as well. That would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a fascinating topic. Whatever. Yeah. So really, what I guess what I'm trying to get out of this is like, if we are going somewhere, what is it? You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of like an art star almost. Idea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're, you've got a really good point. I think a lot of people will say, "Great, this is the manifesto. What does it mean? What is it? What, mm. What's this going to look like?" Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think your logic is 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 sound. Um, I think a lot of people will say to me, "Well, what does an agile mindset mean then?" Right in yeah. the same sort of vein of, but what does it look like? How do how do I know what it is? And I think it's sensible to, to put that out there. I guess the big challenge is how you come to the conclusion that you've got there. Is it more powerful for an organization to figure that out themselves of what we yeah. want to look like, and therefore you're empowering them to get to that themselves, yeah. or do you create the milestone and say this is where you're trying to get to? Um, do you know what I find, Robert? I find that people really, really struggle and they jump at efficiency straight away. Like we just yeah. want to milk the cow and then they could they could get blown away and get, could get disrupted. Mm. So rather than giving them a blank page, uh, I, uh, I could actually uh, create a sentence with a load of blank words and they fill in the words themselves and I mm. could reveal them later on. But by having something, uh, the idea is that you can move words around. So maybe we're not disrupting society. Maybe we're not uh, in that place yet, for example. Yeah. Uh, we're not even disrupting the industry. It might be just the marketplace. Um, and uh, maybe actually we're only looking at more effect, more current value right now because uh, that's where we are kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So on your journey, you could strip that down and say, okay, yeah. if that's the North Star, what do we think we could achieve in the next, say, 12, 18 months? You know what I mean? Yeah. And... Um, yeah, it is a bit of a, it's it's hard to reach. It's not very tangible. I, I would agree with that. Uh, it's uh, it, There's a big journey to get in there. And what I'd like to get to next to your point is, what does it look like? And what does it feel like? Okay. Mm. This is where it gets interesting, right? Because yeah, 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 we do that too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, but here, let's go, right? So it looks like cognitively diverse people collaboration. That's a hat tip to Matthew Syed from his book, Rebel Ideas in 2019, fantastic book. One of my two favorite books. Is, my other favorite book is Black Box Thinking, which is his book as well. So it looks like cognitively diverse people collaboration. I'm not even saying you have to be in a team. Uh, possibly applying holacracy, for example. Oh, okay. Uh, and, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, one of your colleagues as well, is actually practicing that. Uh, could be agile, lean, could be lean. Uh, thinking, talking more kind of 21st century lean rather than the manufacturing lean, if that makes sense. Right. Uh, lean agile, you know, the Kanban guys in there. Um, uh, product management, there's a bit of a schism going on between agile and product management. There's lots of really good ideas in the product management world. So what I'm kind of saying here is you don't necessarily need to be following the agile manifesto. In fact, it doesn't even have to be uh, product management. It could be the three ways of DevOps or it could even be the modern Agile Manifesto. So I, I used to say it's underpinned by the Agile Manifesto, but I think actually that's assuming that people want to be using Agile. There are other ways to achieve agility is kind of what I'm saying here. Hmm. Um, what do you feel about that, Robert? I think you'd be careful you get kicked out of the Agile Club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I agree. I, I think... <laughs> Um, agility sometimes can be its worst enemy in that it can be um, you must do it this way if you're not doing this you're not agile kind of thing um, for me I don't see agile as sort of the end goal I guess which is perhaps sort of what you're saying um, yeah. for me it's it's about creating a workplace that is um, more universally successful um, and by that, I mean, it's not just about, for example, chasing profit or dates or whatever. Um, so when you say, what does it feel like to work there? Um, that people actually feel rewarded. Um, that, um, that, I guess, to be blunt, that they're happy. Um, the dream would be that you can create a workplace where um, people are certainly paid enough. I'm not saying they need to be, you know, 
struggling for money, but um, their main reward is actually the work they're doing, right? Uh, I'm sort of straying into sort of Dan Pink's work here, I guess. Mm. Um, but I, I think that it's we're at a point where the majority of people now are not working for food, right? The majority of people are not working because um, it's necessary, right? We have to have a job to make income. I understand that, but but generally speaking, the majority of the world at the point of they're not earning money at that level or now we're at a sort of um, subsistence kind of level. And so the, what you do becomes more important. It reflects on you and it impacts who you are and how you feel. So I think quite simply, for me, um, where organisations are going uh, requires a new level of consciousness because we're not facing... Um, industrial revolution type problems anymore. We shouldn't be thinking in that way anymore of tell me what to do, I'll go and do it. Um, and so I, I think really the, the big shift here for me for organizational agility is a shift towards organizations made of people who are consciously choosing how they work. And because of that level of empowerment, they'll have a greater level of self-satisfaction um, and of hope. And that's pretty much the reason why I do my job. Yeah, that's kind of where we're going next, actually, right? So, like, in terms of um, what does it feel like as well? Um, mm. It feels like there's less BS, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good cut to everything I said. That was a much better way. To <laughs> there you go. That's yeah. The version, right? I'm a big kind of a hashtag no agile BS kind of guy, but... <laughs> um, and, uh, and what does that mean? I guess less change theater, less delusion... Uh, less micromanaging, less fear. Mm -hmm. It's like saying, well, you know, I, maybe I shouldn't, uh, Leander Herrera would be killing me, you know, why are you talking about things that people shouldn't be doing? And, like, don't think of the red elephant, and that's, that's exactly what we think of, but I think it's good to address it. And then to be, to be more polite and positive about it, I guess, it feels like more humanity, mm. um, more authenticity, uh, more leadership, not necessarily leaders, could be leaders at all levels, right? more engagement yeah. and, and, and not just worrying about the current revenues, but also worrying about the future revenues. So there's a hint here of uh, worrying about the long term as well as the short term, you know, kind of trying to balance that. Yeah. So we're going to dig into this a little bit in terms of what do, what, what do I mean by these? And then let's have a little chat about it. So, you know, what do we mean by hu more humanity? So more compassion. Mm-hmm more invitation, not uh, telling, not imposing ways of working on people you have to do scrum or whatever. Right. More psychological safety. You're, you're in my favorite place now. Yep, absolutely. That's good, yeah. And then trust, respect, team-based commitment, not people making commitment on behalf of teams, more openness, more inclusion, uh, more passion, focus and energy as I had tip to uh, Sir Mantra Goshal. Uh, he did a famous talk at the World Economic Forum a few years ago. And more fun, of course. Mm -hmm. So from a humanity point of view, dealing with that, from an authenticity point of view, well, really having self-managing teams, uh, more self-managing teams. You don't have to be in a team, but if you do have teams of managing. Mm -hmm. More value. We talked about value earlier. More outcomes, more impact, the long-term effect. More sincerity more empiricism and more excellence. So we've got humanity, we've got authenticity there. But now we're going to move on to leadership because one of the reasons, one of the driving factors why I didn't uh, go for a pithy explanation of organization agility, because a lot of leaders, every second or third word was the word agile. Mm -hmm. And I had one particular case where executives, uh, the people on the ground, they run service and there's people on the ground uh, 75% of them believed that the executives knew what the problems were and only 20% of them believed that the executives were doing anything about those problems. So I really want to drill in here on the expectations, okay? So more self-awareness, more courage because you're going to have to do some kind of brave things, more go see, actually find out what's going on. Be more acceptable about people speaking truth to power. And uh, this is a hat tip to uh, Simon Sinek. Uh, he, he, he describes sincerity as more alignment of what is said privately and publicly, mm -hmm. less backlogs, so we can be more optimized as, a, as, a, as a one organization, more prioritization. We can have all the flow we want, but if it's, the work isn't prioritized, uh, you know, we're going to be in trouble. More focus and more flow. 
And then some real behaviors that we need from, from leaders, like embracing uncertainty, not expecting a beautiful mm-hmm. Gantt chart for the end of the year, yeah. serving teams, you know, coaching at all levels, fixing problems, actually fixing problems. Not saying, uh, oh, you've got a mandate. Yeah, you can fix that yourselves. No, we can't. <laughs> Everybody. Uh, and then also, this is where the courage is needed because often organization design work is needed. Because uh, as you mentioned earlier on, Robert, what's our direction of travel or goal or whatever we're trying to achieve or vision, uh, whatever you want to call it, but like whatever that is, agility is only a, is only a way to kind of get there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and often you need to change your organization design to to be optimized for that. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what are your thoughts so far on these? I mean, I'm going to get to engagement wow. and v- revenue later. But How many hours do you have? Yeah, yeah. Um, I like all of those. I, I think the first step for all of those, to, to for any of them to come to fruition, is some level of self-awareness. Um, because... It, Unless we recognize the situation we're in, we can't look to change it. Um, and I think it's very common for people to go to work and just think, but this is how work is. Um, and that's why I always think about previous times in history, because I don't know the future as much as I, I wish I did, right? Um, and we've worked in several different ways in the past. Now we work very much in, or well, we're just moving out of it, but the last few decades have been very much based on Taylorism. Um, and, and, and so... I think it's important that for all those things to occur, that we recognize the way we work so that we have the option to choose different ways of working. Until we know where we are, we can't shift. Um, so self-awareness for me is what will give us those things. You talked about leadership at all levels. So in my mind, that's situational leadership that anyone can lead, right? Mm. Um, for those kind of things to occur, people need to be self-aware that they have the ability to lead a colleague and that person can lead you in different moments and different times. Um, we need to be self-aware of how we're interacting and, and how we pick our targets and how we can achieve them, right, to exactly um, what you spoke about. And I think that it's for the entire organization and individuals to take on this recognition and, and move in that direction because we talk about our competitors all the time in industries and we say, oh, we've got to be competitive, we've got to stay competitive. And it's usually about technologies and things like that. And those will continue. And it's simply a race as to who gets that technology first, right? But if you can actually be competitive in the sense of your organization becomes self-aware, well, then you're going to be miles ahead of your competitors. And I think all the points you're raising there about how the organization works and thinks together, it's not about creating a nice workplace. It's about recognizing that in the future, this will be how companies will be interacting and will be working because the level of consciousness is, is going to shift. Um, all the problems we have in our current um, workplaces are because they were created by that level of consciousness. Einstein said that problems can't be solved by the conscious level that created those problems. You have to move to the next level to be able to actually solve them. And for me, that's why I look at agility because mm. it allows us to look at problems from the next level so we can exactly. easily solve them. Uh, and so that, for me, that's where it all comes together. Yeah, I can't wait to talk to you about that. I'm uh, big into that as well. I, mm. uh, I did a lot of work in spiral dynamics as well, but uh, I, I'm careful about talking about it because it hasn't been peer reviewed. But there, it's like nutrition and lots of other things, you know, mightn't be scientifically proven a lot of the time, but okay. still very useful and um, um, helpful. Um, mm. So I, I just want to get into the engagement and, and, and then the kind of the, the, kind of the, the, the big question really um, about agile and agility. But so what, what, what do we mean by more engagement? So that's like with society itself, with shareholders, employees, customers, mm. consumers, end users partners of the stakeholders but not true big bang less big bang but more uh transparency inspection adaptation some kind of empirical looping approach where you're checking in with these stakeholders Mm -hmm. Uh, because actually a lot of them don't know what they want anyway and uh, we help them to figure out what they really want uh, by showing them what they don't want uh, Mm because they yeah if you get my point and then what do we mean by uh more current and future revenues is well it's about having a more meaningful shared purpose and so this is your point initially robert you know where are we going all right and then mm-hmm. more more value understanding needs and wants as well 
uh, outside in thinking, you know, for the customer in getting out of the building, meeting people. Uh, if there's some slowest part of your organization, if there's some kind of constraint, this is a hat tip to theory of constraints, you know, maybe managing that um, and uh, hat tip to systems thinking maybe more optimized as, as a whole. Mm. So that's quite a long definition of organizational agility. It is like an art star. Mm-hmm. And w- what I'm curious about, Robert, is, you know, when, pe- when some people say, you know, agile is dead, long and live agility, what, what are your thoughts on that? And we're back to the um, using a pithy line and how it's being interpreted, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I think that the Agile Manifesto has multiple problems with it and it's easily um, looked at in a way that um, is potentially arrogant, um, that um, who says things must be done this way. Um And I think agility is more about, as you said at the beginning, being adaptive. And so I think you move away from a statement of you must be agile or agile's best and better than everything Mm. else. Mm. So we're just building an environment where the focus is on achieving more. And by more, I don't mean delivery of more work, right? I don't mean that kind of performance. I I think of performance in the sense of... um, more success for everyone. Um, and so so for me, it's what do you think of as more agility in the future? I guess a good example would be uh, a company like Volvo, right? Volvo turned around and said, we're going to be the first to be pure electric. We're going to be the first for, somebody will never die in one of our cars, right? There's a target so far and above what any other car company was doing that most people just laughed at it almost. But they've seen a massive uptick in sales. Huge. And what you realize is they're tapping into things that aren't traditional. They're not just chasing money, right? And in a world where people are saying, we're worried about plastics, we're worried about carbon pollution, we're worried about the future of the planet, all these kinds of things, Mm. companies need to move beyond traditional models of making money to recognizing that, no, we need to do other things Going back to your point of what's value, um, it, it's it's shifting as it always does, but the thinking is shifting within companies as well. Um, mm. So I, I th- for me, agility in this sense becomes about recognizing what's new and moving in that direction as to what's right for people. Um, it's not a final destination, which maybe agile felt like. Mm. Um, so it's not about achieving something; it's about a constant achievement, perhaps. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I think um, I think the Agile Manifesto is still very useful, but in a sense, mm. it's, it's it's a form of imposition in itself. Mm. You know, these are the values and these are the principles. So when I present them, I just say, well, what resonates with you? And we'll go with that. So it doesn't feel as imposed, but it could be interpreted like that. And But more importantly, I think uh, the Agile Industrial Complex has really messed up Agile. Um, mm. it, it got corrupted. I, I think we corrupt everything in the end. Um, you know, but I think it, it might be time to move on, you know, to um, to something else. Uh, product management holds some hope for me, actually. Hmm. Um, but that will probably get corrupted too at some point. You know, we just need to recognize that we're we might be ready for a new thing, and it's there's more than one way to do this, mm-hmm. and uh, we need to be open to let people work what ways, what way they think is the best way to to get there. Absolutely. People should judge for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And it it presents different problems, you know, for guys like you and me, because when we go in and we've got different teams using different approaches, it's like, oh, we need to be consistent. And I said, no, they don't need to be consistent. You know, they just need to kind of sync up in some way. We need some, maybe we do need some form of alignment, but that doesn't mean we all have to, uh, you know, do exactly the same approach. We can have autonomy with alignment, can't we? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe one of the biggest challenges of, as, as being an agile coach and by no way am I complaining I, I love my job please don't think that's yeah, so, yeah. Um, is the fact that I think people at all the time bring in agile coaches to be agile teachers and say come in and tell them how to do it yeah right? first problem why are you bringing me in yeah 
are you being are you going to change right is the first one <laughs> a leader to change the is a first thing to, to talk to them about yeah. but also a coach doesn't tell you what to do that's not what coaching is mm. coaching is about asking people what they think they should do and then helping them on their journey right yeah um, certainly there's this pearls of wisdom and all that kind of thing but it's their journey as a coach i don't go in and say you need to do this because i don't know they have all the context they know their company know their industry their job and everything right mm. um so yeah I, i think it's one of the challenges that agile is being seen by some people as um i mean a solve all but we shouldn't be doing that but more of a case of we just need to tell people how to do it you, you can't tell people how to how to be agile um agile is is their own thing for each person it's, it's but for me from my point of view of psychology it's about the empowerment of people to be having better lives better careers um and, and for each team and individual that's going to be slightly different robert's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today about agile and uh, organizational agility um and uh, thank you so much for coming on the show genuinely my pleasure i really enjoyed it thank you john thank you so much <laughs>